World War II, the island of Borneo. Seven downed American airmen face an epic struggle for survival in the dense jungle. Natives wielding blowpipes and spears, rumored to be headhunters. And Japanese soldiers hunting them down. To their rescue comes a maverick British major, hell-bent on taking the war into his own hands. There is only one sort of rule in jungle warfare. Do not be smelt before you're heard. Do not be heard before you are seen. And below all, do not be seen. Together they will attempt one of the most audacious escapes in the history of the war. November the 16th, 1944. The crew of a US B-24 bomber has been shot down over the remote island of Borneo. Lost beneath the rainforest canopy, two of the airmen are about to get the shock of their lives. A tribe of natives, who the airmen have been told are vicious headhunters, materialize out of the jungle. We had no idea who they were. Everyone was scared. No one knew what was going on. This first encounter between two utterly different cultures is the start of one of the most extraordinary survival stories in the history of the war. It all began just hours before. High in the skies over Borneo, a formation of American B-24s were on a routine bombing mission against the Japanese. Sitting in the front of one of the aircraft was wireless operator Dan Illerich. The Navy had seen or identified a Japanese aircraft carrier headed for Brunei Bay. And so we were to try to find that aircraft carrier and uh, do what we could. It took the squadrons five hours to fly from Moratai Air Base in the Dutch East Indies over to their target. The 11-man crew had been together for less than six months and were on the eighth mission. The oldest airman was just 22. This was Jim Nock, the engineer. This was me, the radio operator. I was 18 when this picture was taken just getting ready to turn 19. Young and naive, these airmen had been sent to fight a war above a mysterious and little-known country. The third largest island in the world, Borneo is sparsely populated and covered in dense, mountainous jungle. Zoologist Lord Cranbrook has spent his life working in this tropical labyrinth. Borneo was very underexplored. The forests were not regarded as an important resource because uh, timber extraction was impossible in those days. Borneo was always reputed to have gold and what Borneo did actually have was oil. Borneo's oil turned it into a battleground between Japan and the Allies during World War II. After their attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941, the Japanese swiftly captured territories across Southeast Asia. Borneo, under British and Dutch rule, was one of the first to fall, and soon the island was supplying nearly half the oil to fuel Japan's war machine. But nearly three years later, in November 1944, as the American liberators approached Brunei Bay, it was a very different story. Japan was losing its grip on the region, and the US Army Air Forces were bombing oil tankers coming in and out of Borneo. As Dan Illerich's squadron carried out their mission, there were many more ships than expected, and the bomber flew into a maelstrom of anti-aircraft fire. They took us in straight and level for too long, and that gave the Jap gunners a chance to, you know, pick us up. 
With the flight deck and rudder control badly damaged, the aircraft veered off over Borneo's dense jungle interior. Below these trees, the drama was unfolding before the eyes of the natives. For two boys, Ganang Laban and Kapung Balang, their lives would never be the same again. It was very low in the sky and smoking. All we could hear was the sound. And then we saw the smoke. That's all we saw. When it reached Long Kasarun, we saw these parachutes and they came down. We'd never made a jump and we didn't know how we were going to land on the ground. I went down through a bunch of bushes and trees and stuff. I think that's where I got my face all bloody. The airmen had fallen through a wormhole into a forgotten world that they believed was inhabited by savages. Four of them fell some distance from the plane, but two landed a bit closer. The man who was closest to the plane died, but he didn't burn to death. Lieutenant Korn and I landed almost on top of each other. Dan and the B-24's bombardier Phil Corrin had been separated from the five other crew members and they had no idea what had happened to them. I'm the only survivor off of the flight deck. There were four of us on the flight deck. Uh, Fred Brennan, the navigator, was killed outright. The uh, pilot, Tom Coberly. Phil knew that the burning aircraft would soon draw unwanted attention to their position. They needed to move. We were on the side of the hill, very close to where the airplane went in, and of course we were wanting to get away from there, so it was downhill. It was pure jungle. We didn't know where we were, we didn't know who we were going to deal with, and we were going to have to try to organize some, get ourselves organized somehow. We had no idea of Jap Japanese occupation of where we were. At the heart of the airmen's fears was what the Japanese might do to them if they were captured. Japan's soldiers were known to torture and execute their prisoners. And a photograph of one particular beheading had been widely circulated among Allied aircrew. The B-24 had crashed near the tiny settlement of Long Kasaroon a good distance from Japanese garrisons stationed on the coast. But the remoteness of the location brought its own danger. Meeting the natives, the notorious wild men of Borneo. Westerners called them all Dayaks, but there were in fact over 200 different tribes, and the airmen had heard that some of them were ferocious headhunters. It was a few days before we could get to the plane. The day after it happened, we couldn't get close to the plane. The fire was very hot and we couldn't go near it. The river was full of fuel, so much fuel. Lots of the jungle around the river was burnt because of all the fuel in the river. By the time the Dayaks had arrived at the crash site, Dan and Phil had moved off down the mountain, but they were not out of danger. At the point we came out, there was uh, the beach area where we were. And we were sitting on the sand, sand on the slope of the sand, uh, when both of us felt that we were, you know, something was happening. We, we sensed it. And that was when the Dayaks first found us. And they, they reluctantly appeared. They were across the river, and they were being very cautious about approaching us. 
And then one of, one of the, the, the Dayaks got brave enough to come across the stream towards us. And as he walked up the, the sand bank, and he saw that the uh, holster, and all of a sudden he started hollering, USA, USA, USA. Dan and Phil couldn't understand how these so-called savages had heard of the United States. In fact, this tribe, called the Lundaya, had met some of their fellow countrymen before. In the 1930s, Protestant missionaries from America had ventured into the Borneo interior. Reverend John Wilfinger had been remarkably successful, and many of the Lundaya were now evangelized. But the Japanese invasion brought the missionaries' work to an abrupt end. Historian and author Judith Hyman has lived in countries across Southeast Asia, including Borneo. Most of the missionaries had been rounded up and taken off to a camp and murdered, including the wives and the babies. And this horrified, uh, just horrified the Lundayan. Their favorite local missionary, John Wilfinger, who had escaped from this because he happened to have been up country, gave himself up and was taken down to Tarakan and was executed there on Christmas Eve. Wilfinger's public beheading had shocked the Lundaya tribespeople, and many of them now hated the Japanese occupiers. Now these Dayaks would treat the downed US airmen as honored guests and take them into their homes. We went directly to a longhouse. They prepared dinner for us, and then as the sun went down and became dark, we sat around the fire and they went about their customary things of doing, and they showed us where they wanted us to go to sleep, and we just, we spent the night. The young Americans had found shelter among people they had been told were fearsome savages, but they still had no idea how they might make it out of the jungle. What the airmen could not know was that over in London, secret plans were afoot that would transform the war in Borneo and bring them an unlikely savior. Before World War II, roughly a third of Borneo had been controlled by the British, and the United Kingdom hadn't given up on its colony. Just two weeks after Pearl Harbor, the Special Operations Executive were already planning to sabotage the oil fields and conduct guerrilla attacks against the Japanese in the interior. But to carry out this kind of warfare, they needed someone with local knowledge. They found this in an upper-class, self-taught anthropologist who had led an expedition to Borneo in 1932. Tom Harrison. With no combat experience, Harrison seemed an unlikely choice, but he had actually lived with the Dayaks and understood their customs and traditions. He fell in love with the people. He found them very congenial, uh, which they are. They're so courteous, they're so polite. Um, they're, they're very friendly, and I think he had a good time as a young man there. So. I think that was why how his enthusiasm had arisen, and then he was one of the very few people available who seemed to have some kind of expertise on the interior of Borneo. But what the British military planners did not yet know was that Tom Harrison was something of a maverick. He had been tattooed like a native and believed that the only way to understand local tribes' people was near total immersion. When the British approached him about going into Borneo again, Harrison jumped at the opportunity. He wanted to anthropologize. He wanted to, to understand how their society worked. And uh, there are a lot of anthropologists who think you can do this by getting close to them. I'm sure the daredevilness was uh, an aspect of his character that they liked, ready for anything, yes. But the American airmen knew nothing of Tom Harrison. And for the moment, they had only the Dayaks to protect them from the Japanese. The morning after the crash, the natives led Dan Illerich and Phil Corrin to a lean-to in the jungle, where two more of their crew were being sheltered. The four of us got together 
Eddie was blinded. He was, he couldn't see because of some cut wounds and wounds to his eyes. So we stayed there until Eddie was able to, to see and maybe be able to walk. Meanwhile, word of the downed airman had reached the district officer charged with running this area for the Japanese, William Makahanap. This is a photo of William Makahanap. Very brave man. With a very brave wife right behind him. Hour behind the throne. Makahanap was not from Borneo, but another island in the Dutch East Indies. Formerly a teacher with the American missionaries, he was now the liaison between the Dayaks and the Japanese. When news of the downed aircraft reached him, he felt duty-bound to inform his Japanese bosses further downriver. But although he officially answered to the Japanese, Makahanap's loyalties lay elsewhere. He's still fondly remembered by natives like Belapang Baru. That man was really good with the people. That was Makahana. He was working as the district officer here. Makahana and his wife were committed Christians. They could not forget what the Japanese had done to the American evangelists and weren't about to let them do the same to the airmen. His job was to turn them over to the Japanese and between his own conscience and the even more strenuous conscience of his Christian wife, he couldn't do it. Instead, Makahanap met with the local Dayak headmen and asked them to help him hide the airmen. But finding a good hiding place presented its own problems. Because of their Christian beliefs, many of the newly converted Dayaks would be unable to lie if the Japanese came upriver to question them. So Makahanap needed to move the airmen to a wilder, more remote area that had not been evangelized. Makahanap started moving us west, deeper into uh, non-Christian areas. When the Japanese heard the American airmen had landed in the jungle, they came up to Longbarang to look for them. Longbarang was Makahanap's administrative seat and also where he lived with his young family. The Japanese knew from the district officer that the airmen had landed somewhere around here but they had no idea that the Dayaks were already hiding them deep in the jungle. We built huts for the Americans twice. They spent one night in the first hut, and on the second night, we moved them somewhere upriver, to a small river on a route that no one would pass along. The Japanese sent a patrol upriver to Long Barang, now determined to flush out the airmen once and for all. There was chaos in the village. Japanese were coming in and out. People from other villages came to look for the Americans. I told them the Americans had left and we didn't know where they'd gone. The Japanese were asking us, where is the airmen? They went to look for the airmen, but we'd hidden them. The Japanese hostility struck a raw nerve among the Dayaks, many of whom harbored a deep resentment towards their occupiers. As well as beheading their American missionaries, the Japanese had confiscated food and goods, killed livestock, and worst of all, mistreated the local women. They always bothered the girls. They would go after them. That's why we were so upset with them. All the people had a big meeting about killing the Japanese. They were saying, if we don't kill them, 
then we'll become the victims. They'll execute all of us. Enraged by the death threats, Makahanap and the Dayaks were about to cross a line from which there would be no return. It was time to strike back. A group of Dayak warriors crept into the longhouse where three Japanese were staying and swiftly killed them with their machetes. But there were more patrols coming up river, piloted by native boatmen who had been forced into service by the Japanese. Two boats came, maybe three or four boats. The river was flooded at the time. When they reached the rapids at Long Paku, all of the boatmen stepped out and started dragging the boats up the river. After they'd pulled the boats up, they made camp and the Japanese started sleeping inside the boats. They were still asleep when the boatmen turned around and stabbed them all to death. Even the women were enlisted in the fight. Makahanap came up with a daring plan involving one of the most beautiful girls in Long Barang, Binam. We asked Binam and some of the other girls to bathe naked in the river and stand on a rock calling out to the Japanese. Then the Japanese came down to the river and went towards them. My friend Lasang Dawat and I took out our spears and stabbed them and slashed them in the back. But the Dayaks weren't just executing the Japanese. Makahanap and the other warriors had tacitly agreed to resurrect an ancient and bloody rite headhunting. Yes, we cut them here, and here, and here. Every single Japanese soldier who came into their district was killed, and many of the bodies were beheaded. We brought the heads and distributed them to every village. After the heads had been taken, the villages were very peaceful. Headhunting had not been carried out in Borneo for over a decade. The island's rulers, the British and the Dutch, had outlawed the practice at the turn of the century. But despite the official ban, Many Lundaya felt empty about losing something that had been intrinsic to their culture for hundreds of years. The people who, who hadn't become Christian had a big hole in the middle of their religion. It was like having the mass without the wine or the bread. They didn't have the central right, and it didn't have the excitement, the thrill, the courage, the blood that had been part of, of headhunting. Hidden deep inside the jungle, the US Airmen had no idea what had just happened. They were about to witness an extraordinary event that few living Westerners had ever seen. We were down to no firewood and no machetes to cut firewood with, and all we had was raw rice. And we, we thought we were in bad shape. And then they came and got us, and they brought us back, took us back down to Pentagon Lagan's place, longhouse, and that's where we walked into smoking heads over the fire. The young airmen were now honored guests at a headhunting feast. A celebration of eating, drinking, and dancing that would last for several days. There was 
insistent ringing of gongs. And that was their music, they, the different tones of, of brass gongs, and they, were, they beat out rhythms. Am I, am I... Yes, we wanted to celebrate, to celebrate for winning the war. The Japanese heads were washed and wiped dry before being smoked over the longhouse fire. According to the ritual, these were protective measures to ensure no misfortune came to the longhouse. If the airmen needed any proof of the Dayak's loyalty and their preparedness to take risks, this was it. Very happy that it wasn't our heads hanging there smoking. That's their way of life. I was a guest in their house. I wasn't going to criticize what they were doing. That was my feeling. That's, maybe I should have felt bad about it, but I didn't. I knew that that could have been my head in a sack going down a river if it had been reversed. The Americans were very happy when we killed the Japanese because now they knew they were safe. America. Now that his Dayaks had seen off the Japanese patrols, Makahana moved the airmen back into the village at Long Barang. But two months in the harsh jungle conditions had taken its toll. Suffering from malnutrition and tropical diseases, each airman had lost close to 15 kilograms. But hope was around the corner. The anthropologist Tom Harrison was about to parachute into Borneo, and unlike the Americans, his drop was planned. Away from the lost world of the Dayaks, Japanese territories were being captured across Southeast Asia, and taking Borneo was now a key objective for Britain and Australia. In June 1944, Tom Harrison, now a British major, was sent to Australia on loan to a special forces unit known as Z-Force. The anthropologist turned soldier would lead a unit of commandos into the interior to begin the guerrilla operations and also attempt to rescue any downed Allied airmen they came across. He knew there were Americans before, they, uh, before he came in and he was under instructions to do his best to find them and to get them back out again. Among Harrison's commandos was a young sergeant, Jack Treadray. Each of us had a specialist part in the team. I was the team medic. We had our radio man, we had our armaments man, and each one of us had to be able to do the other's work as well. The official plan was to enter Borneo from the coasts and travel inland upriver. But Harrison put forward a radically different idea parachuting directly into the interior, where the fiercely independent Dayaks might be more willing to cooperate with the Allies. During his expedition 13 years earlier, Harrison had heard rumors of a flat and fertile plain in the center of the island. We had gone a good way inland, but much further inland we saw great mountain ranges, and we heard that behind them lay a sort of Shangri-La. But did his Shangri-La even exist? And would it be suitable as a drop zone? In early 1945, Tom Harrison persuaded his military bosses to let him go on a reconnaissance trip from his unit's base in the Dutch East Indies. Flying over the island's jungle interior, with the rainforest canopy stretched out below him, it was almost impossible to see anything. But then, as the aircraft headed home, Harrison spotted a clearing. On the first day, the plane came circling overhead. And we were really scared. And we were thinking, what in the world is this? Then the plane went away. On March the 25th, the aircraft returned. Harrison and his commando's mission was about to begin. Before we got on the plane to do our jump, Tom Harrison, our party leader, opened up a tin and handed us all a tablet. And he said, that's the old pill. It's cyanide. If you're in trouble, bite it. 
and that'll be it. The next day, four planes came, circling, circling. Then eight men came down. They were parachuting down. And we looked up at them, and they were just this big. They parachuted over there. The plane was circling overhead, and then they landed over there. When they reached the ground, there was a signal, and then smoke. Soon, Harrison was met by a party of the local tribe, called Kalabits, and led through the fields to the longhouse. Things became fearfully confused. The main overall reaction was bewilderment, amazement, coupled with dreadful efforts to ask questions from both sides. The first things the Kalabits wanted to know were, were we humans, and how did we get out of the aeroplane? Harrison's biographer, Judith Hyman, is one of the few people able to read the spidery scrawl of his wartime diary. Now this is the first page of the diary after Tom landed in Barrio. They spend all day um, looking, searching for torpedoes, which were the ways in which they parachuted in supplies. And then it ends with Borak, exclamation point. Borak was the local rice beer. And Harrison knew from his previous expeditions that it was a surefire way of immersing himself in the native culture. <laughs> the next day, the Major sent Jack Treadray out on his first task, distributing medicine among the local tribespeople. He drew a big circle on my map, and he said, I want you to go to every one of those kampongs, find out whatever information you can, treat everyone you can, the gift of medicine was to show the natives that Harrison's commandos would not behave like the Japanese. 100% of the population had malaria, either amoebic or bacillary dysentery. They were in a bad way. Meanwhile, some 80 kilometers away, the US airmen were about to find out about the new arrivals. Well, we thought we got another crew. Makahana took off for that area to see what was, what was going. If another crew, he was going to bring it in. And that's when he found out that Harrison was there. A few days later, Makahana brought the airman a letter from Harrison. The Americans quickly realized from his eccentric style that they weren't dealing with an ordinary officer. My dear fellow, as an Englishman, I had better start like this. I have brought in a party of eight, not only to bugger up the Japs, but also specifically to look for lost whites and help them to get out in any way we can. He asked for the senior officer and any radio personnel to come and visit with him. So we went off to see Harrison. After nearly five months waiting for rescue, Dan Illerich and two other airmen set out for Harrison's base. After a week and a half's walk through mountainous jungle, they finally met Harrison on April the 21st. The Major wasted little time with greetings and quickly put Dan to work with Australian radio operator Bob Long. The first photograph was one of me taken in uh, 1941. Dan, Dan was easy to work with. He was, he was quite good uh, at the figure and the code part of it. Uh, he was slow on his moors. And you know, when you sit around in a longhouse for four months doing nothing and a man offers you a, champ to pra a chance to practice your trade, I'm not going to turn him down. I just thought that as an opportunity to be able to do something to keep me busy and help out until they could get us out. With radio communications up and running, Harrison signaled to the U.S. Army Air Forces that some of their missing airmen had survived the jungles of Borneo. Meanwhile, his operatives began training the local people into guerrilla fighters, 
using basic Malay to speak to the wide variety of tribes in the area. I worked with Ibans, others worked with uh, Kayans, Kenyans, Murats. There's so many tribes over there and they all had their own territories. Uh, but we took whoever volunteered. Harrison was now settling into the native culture, going barefoot and wearing local clothing. He also ignored official orders to wait for the main invasion of Borneo and ordered his guerrillas to begin attacking the Japanese. We couldn't afford to keep our enthusiastic supporters kicking their heels for months. Luckily, we were able to combine business with pleasure, so to speak. Within a couple of months, our ambushes had bagged three complete patrols. Not a lot, but it made the whole interior feel that now, at last, they were fighting. He was a brilliant organiser. He let us fight our war the way we wanted to. If there had ever been any rules of engagement in guerrilla warfare, Harrison was about to bend them yet further. Taking advantage of the natives' jungle craft, he persuaded them to use one of their hunting weapons against the Japanese, the blowpipe. These two natives and I were laying in wait and uh, one of them said to me, with your snapang to him, that is rifle, you can shoot somebody and they won't necessarily die. But one of my poison darts, even if it hits them only in the little finger, they're dead. You could be five yards inside the jungle, away from a jungle track, and they would not know you were there. The jungle was so dense. And all that would poke out would be that end. Right? Yep. You ready, Jack? Yeah. yeah. Harrison showed no qualms about using poison on the Japanese. His thoughts, written after the war, evoke Harrison's contempt for his enemy, but also reveal a darker side to the anthropologist's war record. The Japs could never cope with blowpipes, and the mere suspicion that there were blowpipers around did more to them than a dozen machine guns. I don't know if we were breaking any of the rules of war. Frankly, we didn't care. I think his groping's pretty good. Harrison, the anthropologist, was embracing the Dayak's culture and twisting their traditions to suit his purpose. The Maverick Major soon realized there was another way of uniting the natives against their common enemy, something Makahanep had allowed three months earlier, headhunting. These folks know how to fight. They know how to fight silently with their blowpipes. Um, and they're dying to get back to hunting heads. Harrison let it be known that headhunting was no longer outlawed if the heads were Japanese. And he even encouraged the ritual with a bounty. Tom Harrison offered the natives five guilders, Dutch guilders, for any heads they brought in. As the bloodshed continued, Harrison was back at base, totting up the figures. K column for killed, P for prisoner. His commandos were just as casual. Personally, I didn't uh, care one way or the other because uh, we didn't like the Japanese, the Japanese didn't like us, and we knew if they caught us, we wouldn't only be uh, killed, we'd be tortured pretty fiercely beforehand. The Japs did not have a very good reputation. The natives hated them, and so it made our job much easier. Those first Jap heads thrilled the jungle people. The difficulty was to control the Japs from going too far. On May the 1st, 1945, Borneo's D-Day arrived. 11,000 Australian soldiers landed at Tarakan, a small but highly strategic island off the northeast coast of Borneo. Within weeks, the landings had secured an airfield. The Allies were now less than 250 kilometers from Balawit, a flat valley where Harrison had recently moved his headquarters. With air support now so close, Harrison saw an opportunity to get the sick and weak US airmen out of the jungle. He was already thinking of an audacious rescue plan. 
Harrison had heard that the Australians had a British short takeoff and landing plane, the Oster, that had the range to get into his valley. But first, he needed an airstrip. Gala Raut was a boy at the time and remembers Harrison's unusual requirements. He had a meeting with all of the elders and he asked them, can you give me land because we need to make an airstrip? The land they were using was waterlogged and Harrison quickly realised that building an airstrip here would be a major challenge. He was worried that an aeroplane might get stuck in the mud. So he asked us, what can we do? What can we put on it? So some of the older people said, we can put bamboo on the airstrip. Now in their 80s, these are some of the Dayaks who ingeniously adapted bamboo to make an airstrip. The trunks were unfolded into decking 90 metres long, supposedly the length needed for an oster to land and take off. It was something that we'd, we'd never ever uh, contemplated or seen or thought of before, but uh, that probably the only bamboo airstrip ever built in the world, I should imagine. With more than a thousand volunteers, the project was completed in less than two weeks. One of Harrison's commandos took these photos of the airstrip. The eccentric major had his airport. Now all he needed was someone brave enough to land on it. On June 7th, 1945, Two Australian pilots flew into Tom Harrison's jungle kingdom after the Major told them that the airstrip was ready. The American grasshopper is very similar to the tiny Oster. Dan has come to see one at his local flying club in Houston. They flew two of them in. And they landed all right because you can take a small airplane and when you bring it in for an approach to landing, you can land it in a very short distance. What nobody knew yet was whether the airstrip was long enough for takeoff. Typically, Tom Harrison volunteered to be the first passenger to test it out. They went to the end of the runway and made their takeoff run, and it, at that altitude, they just didn't have airspeed when they ran out of, of uh, runway, and they got off into the mud with, from the rice paddy. The Oster flipped over on its back, damaging the plane, but not its passengers. The workers used bamboo to extend the runway and also, with guidance from the Australian pilot, to patch the broken Oster back together. On June the 10th, the Oster took off again, this time with the first of the US airmen. When the aircraft touched down in Tarakan, the fuselage broke in two, but the men walked away unharmed. Tom Harrison's Shangri-La now had its very own airport. But by now, the Major's maverick tendencies were running wild, and he decorated the strip with an array of national flags and a token Japanese head. When one man who had been tortured by the Japanese and had scars all over his legs uh, came up, bringing him the head of the Japanese police chief of Lawas, he accepted the head most gratefully and had it uh, flown from a flagpole. Over the next few weeks, the remaining airmen were flown out one at a time from the bamboo airstrip. But one of the Americans wasn't quite ready to leave. I volunteered to stay as long as possible. And to in order to be able to continue to work with Bob, and I said, okay, now I'll be the last one out, and that'll give us a day or two more that I can help with the uh, signals operation. On June the 29th, seven months after parachuting in, Dan Illerich was finally flown out of Borneo. Less than two months later, a conflict fought with blowpipes and machetes was overtaken by news of the atomic bombs dropped on Japan.
It would be another year before Tom Harrison was to leave the world of the Dyaks that he'd come to love so much. With over a thousand Japanese soldiers dead, he had transformed his Shangri-La into a killing field, securing an extraordinary victory for the Allies that would have been impossible without his native army. I hope the British government will never forget that in Borneo, it was the hill tribes, the so-called backward and uncivilized peoples who proved the truest and the bravest citizens. The airmen were flown back to their homes across the United States, now keepers of an extraordinary story that few people would ever believe. Dan Illerich, the only one of them still alive today, has never forgotten what the Dayaks did for him and his fellow Americans. We parachuted into their community in 1944, and they were courageous enough to take us in, protect us, and prevent our captures. These guys knew that they were running a big risk when they, when they started operations against the Japanese, and I certainly think they're heroes, or I wouldn't be standing here talking to you.